Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Impact. Wake up. Hello? Hello? Hey, it's only 32 degrees. We got, a, well, sort of above freezing, but we're at 32 degrees, and we're in the house of the Lord, and it's going to get hot in here in a minute. Amen? Amen. The flame of the Holy Spirit is going to roll through this place, and we're going to be feeling hot. We're going to jump to our feet, and we're going to praise the name of Jesus Christ, right? Amen? That's good to be in the house, Lord. And, hey, I don't want to forget the faithful followers that watch us online. Thank you so much. You know, I, when I think about Brad's message, game changers, game changer, prayer changes everything, right? Amen? And the people who are watching right now at home, and I know we got some faithful people who are trying to stay safe, and we understand that, and that's why we have the online access. And we think of you when you're at home, and we're praying for you, and we thank you so much that you're game changers. Even though you can't come into this church, and you're watching from home, you're game changers still because you're praying for us. So keep praying for us wherever you're watching that. We love you. We miss you being in the, uh, the church house, but we understand, and we're praying for you as well. So just uh, think about that, and uh, we're all the body of Christ, right? Wherever we're at, we're worship, we're coming together, and we're glad to see you here this morning. A couple things. Before I forget, Jim Scott, uh, he's still looking for life group leaders, people who want to get involved, get trained, and, and maybe host and have a teacher come in and teach. There's different ways to do that. But see Jim Scott at the end of service back in the corner where the Christmas tree is. So go back and see him to get more information about that. Uh, you see this awesome shirt I'm wearing, right? This awesome shirt, right? So if you order one, there's sweatshirts and all, go back and see Silas at the end of the church. He's at the tech table. So go back and see him at the end of service. If you ordered one, they're here, so you can go pick that up. Who watched the game last night? The game, right? I just say the game. We're not, we're not talking about Arizona Cardinals. No, no, we're talking about the Liberty Flames. Whew. Man, that's a, that was a heart stopper. Uh, I, 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 Hugh Freeze had to have some prayer warriors on his side, right? Because he, I'm sorry, Hugh Freeze, if you're watching this, you made some bad calls. I mean, if you're going to kneel down on the one-yard line, kneel down on the one-yard line. Whew, that fumble, man, the heart stopper. But God was on his side, on the team uh, flame side, and they were able to block that kick at the end and win that game. Amazing victory for Liberty Flames. So, uh, so proud of our Flames and how they finish out the season. Uh, it's just an exciting time. So just uh, now that uh, they've won, I pray that they use that opportunity to, to use the platform that has been built for them to Tell, lead people to Jesus Christ. Um, last thing, uh, we've been given a gift for each one of you. Somebody's donated. Uh, it's like the, the wristbands, and it's got spiritual uh, armor on it. Uh, each one, as you leave today, when you go out these doors, make sure or you just go to the hospitality table before you leave. Uh, we have a gift for you to take home. You can wear the wristband to remind you of the spiritual armor that God has provided us with. If you don't wear that, put it in a special place, you know, in your car or at the refrigerator. See, if I put mine at the refrigerator, I'd not see it 100 times a day. So I, I always go by the refrigerator. Uh, but put it somewhere to remind you that, hey, you know what? That series that we've been through, the spiritual battle, we're always in the spiritual battle. The series may be ending, but the battle never will as long as we're living here on this planet. But God has provided us with the armor, right? God has provided us with the armor so we can stand. And when we've done all to stand, we can continue to stand. And so that's somebody that wanted to give you this, each one of you, to put on and remember that, hey, we're in a spiritual battle. So, so make sure you see a hospitality table on the way out and give, get you one and then just remember that God is on your side working to fight for you and giving you the tools to fight for uh, your family and you're in this battle. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer so we can start worshiping. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your blessings and your, and your love for us and how you provided for us. Thank you for it. it. It's cold outside, but man, it just feels so warm in here in your house. Uh, we thank you so much for your love for us and for your provision over and over again. We're able to come together uh, and to worship. And we thank you for those who are watching online right now. Uh, we love them and we miss them. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a... Uh, we're, we may be worshiping different formats, but God, you have our family knit together tightly. Uh, and we just pray for them as they pray for us. And, and we want to be a church that's a true game changer. Uh, this is, needs to be a church that prays for each other constantly. That's how we, th that's how we make eternal change uh, in our country, in our lives, in our families, uh, ultimately for the eternity of people that are around us. 
So let us be a church that prays without ceasing. Let us be a church that prays for those around us without ceasing. Let us pray for our neighbors. Let us pray for our government. We may not always agree or approve of what our government does, but you still command us to pray for our leaders and pray for our authority. Because, God, what we can't change, you can. Uh, with our prayers, you can make a huge difference. You can bring a revival. And I truly believe that is, the, that is what our country ultimately needs, is a revival in our, our whole land. Uh, start it with us. Spread it through the Virginia, through the East Coast, through the West Coast, and around the world. But, Father, revival is what we need. We need to have Jesus Christ put in the proper place, put at the top of everything, uh, first in our hearts so that we can serve him and that we can lead other people to serve him. Because once Jesus is in our hearts, everything else changes. We love you, and we thank you so much for this church. We love Brad. We ask that you continue to put a special anointing on him, fill him with your spirit, help him to remain bold and remain true to the gospel as he reads Scripture, as he teaches Scripture, as he preaches us the boldness of Scripture. Help him to be strong. Fill him up, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Impact Church. We're glad to see you. Y'all stand and worship with us this morning. In the name of Jesus, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name. In the name of Jesus, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching everything. darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, that is who you are. That is who you are, God, and we are here to worship you today. And Lord, we just pray over this service that there just be a movement. God, because we already know that you're here, God. We know that there are miracles taking place and healing taking place and victory that is happening in this place this morning, God. And we know that the enemy... He seeks to devour and destroy each one of us, God, but we know that you are the overcomer and you have, you've got victory, God, and we've got victory through you, and your word tells us that we are more than conquerors because you love us, God. And God, as we are still celebrating some of this Christmas season, God, that we know that you sent your precious son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us, to be born in the flesh, God, to just serve, to serve us, God, and to be that, that sacrifice for us, God, we just... We are so thankful and humbled by that, God. And we just come here today to worship you. And we worship you, Lord Jesus. And we're so thankful for the presence that's here and the healing that's taking place and the victory that's taking place over this service today. We pray that you anoint Brad over this service today. God, anoint him to speak your word and let it pierce the hearts of your people. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Impact. Hey, can we give this praise team a big round of applause this morning? Man, I want to know something. I want to know if y'all are excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Man, hope you guys had a great Christmas and we had a great uh, Christmas Eve service here just a, a couple nights ago. It was an amazing night. Many of you are here. Some of you may not have had a chance to come and, and, and take part in that with us. So we hope you did on Facebook Live. But man, it was just an amazing night. And I just want to give a big thanks. And I want you to understand the amount of effort, the amount of work that it takes to put on a service here. And especially to have something extra during the week. And I, I want to just let you know that we have a very uncommon group of people that the Lord has brought to Impact Church that do amazing things for His glory. I mean, when you look at what the Lord has allowed this church to get done since day one and, and the outreach to the community and the, the Easter egg hunts and, and the trunk or treat events with 1,500, 2,000 people attending and coming and hearing the gospel and, and just see the outreach that we've been able to do this Christmas and, and to reach out to many families and, and to give them a Christmas that they would not have had. And then on top of that, for people to come out in the pouring rain on Christmas Eve, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, mud everywhere. I mean, we had people out just putting down even wood chips so we could come in and, and not look like we were like a lumberjack with mud up to our knees. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, just people getting it done. You know, we had young men out here putting a, a, a pad in with some pavers the, the night before slaving, you know, in, in the cold. So God is doing some amazing work. So I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to those of you who serve Jesus behind the scenes. Amen. And, and don't ask for any glory. They, they never get on camera. They're never on stage, but they're the ones that make it happen. You know, and, 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 and that's not to, to lift up a person, but that's just to show that the Spirit of God is moving and He's moving people to do His work to make this happen. So we would love, that being said, if you're visiting Impact Church this morning and you're here, maybe you've been stirring in your heart for the Lord to, to, to get you to find a church home, a place that you could belong, we would love for you to be right here. Because I can tell you, we're just getting started. There's a lot of work ahead, and, and we need the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest field. There's a harvest field here, guys, and we would love for you to be a part of what God's doing. So welcome to Impact. Let us know you're here. Fill out a connection card. Um, tell, meet us after the service, something. We'd love to know who you are. Pray with you as you find a church home. And also, besides the Christmas Eve service, we had a, another special event here last night. Anybody watch the LU football game last night? Man, that was amazing. We had a 
hey, uh, kind of a watch party here. And, and Daniel Hinckley, I don't know if you guys know him, man. I'm going to give a shout out to him. That dude come in here the night before last and started cooking and cooked all night long. He got his uh, smokers cooked out cooked us some pork and brisket and, and wings, and a uh, man, it's just amazing. He cooked all night long in the cold, and we had an amazing time. I mean, a really amazing time because we were, there's people in here screaming at these screens last night, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you know, if somebody was over at the fire department or driving by, they was like, man, I didn't know that church was a Pentecostal church, but <laughs> I mean, it, it was loud, and, and, and it was great, and you know, I got to thinking, I was like, man, we can get that excited, we could get that pumped up over a football game, we need to get that pumped up for Jesus today, all right? <laughs> hey, and I'm not going to judge, you feel like you need to stand up, give a fist pump, and a yeah, or something, just do it, man, you know, if the spirit gets moving, whatever. So we want to get excited about Jesus today, and what God is doing in the hearts and lives of his people. And you know, it takes no introduction to come off of the holiday that we just celebrated, because it was more than a holiday, it was a birthday. And I hope you celebrated it as such, that it was the coming of the Messiah, the one and only true God to walk in the flesh on this earth and give his life up as a ransom for many. But you know, unfortunately, there's so many people that still don't believe. There's people out here today, and maybe at the sound of my voice on Facebook, or maybe you're here today visiting, and maybe it's your first time in church in a while, and you're still wrestling with the thought of, of, of is God real, and, and who is Jesus, and can I believe all this, and can I really put my life and my faith and my hope and my everything in this story of a child who was born some 2,000 years ago? Some people still wrestle with who God is, and you know, and, and it's not anything really new or, or uncommon for people to, to wrestle with things and, and, and believe in things, maybe at times that they don't even see. I mean, when you look, there's a lot of things through history that people have tried to explain the reality of. A lot of mystical things, even like unicorns and mermaids, the Loch Ness Monster, things that really don't exist that people have tried to prove that are. Debates and explanations go on, and, and especially at the time when, when science was taken forth on gravity and, and trying to explain gravity and what that phenomenon was on this earth. How about just the very earth itself and its shape? That at one time, did you know that people thought the earth was, was square? And then this concept came that, no, it's actually round. And it's like, what? And people pushed back against that and didn't believe it and fought against it until proof was given. Some people even believe in things that have never been proven, though, to exist or that they've never seen with their own eyes. How about the legendary figure Sasquatch? <laughs> Bigfoot, right? Did you know that 20% of Americans believe Bigfoot is real? There's even some people, some claim to be grown men, <laughs> that go around their whole life trying to find this sucker. I mean, seriously. How about ghosts? I mean, and I'm not talking about angelic and, and demonic spiritual forces that we know are biblical and that are real. I'm talking about actual physical ghosts, you know, like Casper. And that's like you see, 46% of Americans believe ghosts are real. Seriously. How about UFOs, aliens? 50% of Americans believe aliens are real, although 20% of those people have never even reported to seen an AFO or an alien. And many of the people that have seen them were influenced a little bit too much by Jack Daniels and Hennessy. But yet people still search out these things that they've never seen and put their belief in things that maybe don't even exist. It was interesting when I was studying and looking at this that 65% of Americans still believe in God, that God exists. Well, that's good to know that at least God's got a commanding lead over Bigfoot, aliens, and ghosts. I mean, but then it's discouraging to see that this belief in God is getting less every year. Less and less people are saying they believe in God, and actually more and more people are saying they believe and aliens, ghosts. 
How long will it take before that's completely flipped? What are people putting their belief in? Does God exist? Does he? The Bible claims, of course, that God is real and he's the one and only true God, but then it goes a step further. And this is where we're going to bring this focus back again for this Christmas season on this second Christmas message. Is the Bible says that God actually came and made himself flesh and dwelt among us. And the baby that was born in Bethlehem in a manger, who was more than a baby, he was more than just a, a man, that he was God in the flesh. Can we believe that? Is that true? So what we want to look at today is who is Jesus to you? Because that's the question at hand, and it's the title of our message today. Who is, not just who is Jesus, but who is Jesus to you? Have you answered that question? Are you solid on that question? Because you need to be. You know, it's a, a big question in the world today, even amongst those who maybe believe and half believe and, and understand a little bit about what the Bible says, but they still can't put their trust and faith in him. I think of the, the sacrilegious kind of rock opera play, musical kind of play that's been put on called Jesus Christ Superstar. And, and I, I looked up the words of this stuff because I didn't know much about it. And, and it, just, it just hit me with the question and, and the, the putting down of Christ. And I want to read these words for you. This is from that, that song, Jesus Christ Superstar, that, that's in that play. And these words from the, the verses are supposed to be the, the words of Judas, the betrayer of Christ. That's scary, isn't it? And I want you to listen to this. It says, tell me what you think about your friends at the top. Who do you think, besides yourself, was the pick of the crop? Buddha, was he where it's at? Is he where you are? Could Muhammad move a mountain? Or was that just PR? Did you mean to die like that? Was that a mistake? Or did you, did you, did you know your messy death would be a record breaker. Another verse, don't get me wrong, I only want to know. Every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let the things you did go get so out of hand. You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned. Why do you choose such a backward time in such a strange land? If you'd come today, you would have reached a whole nation. Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. Don't you get me wrong, I only want to know. And then here's the chorus that sings out throughout the song. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who are you? What have you sacrificed? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who are you? What have you sacrificed? Jesus Christ, superstar, do you think you're what you say you are? Jesus Christ, superstar, do you think you're what they say you are? Is he who he says he is? Is he God? How do you know? How do you know? Boy, that's important, isn't it? Let's look at that today. Can we walk out of here definitively today and know that we know that we know that this baby that came 2,000 years ago that we celebrate the birth of at Christmas, can we know that he was more than just a man? Because if we can, and if we can walk out of here definitively saying that he is God, then I'm going to tell you today that he is worthy for you to give your life to. And no, no more excuses you get confronted with the, the resurrected Messiah today. You get to, to confronted with the message of Jesus, and you have a choice to make. To re receive him or to reject him. But see, here's the truth. He's more than just a good man. He's more than just another prophet or a teacher. He's more than just a myth or a fable. What is he? 
Then is he just a crutch for the feeble-minded and weak at heart? Who is he? Because here's the truth. You can try to ignore him. You can try to run from him. You can try to say he isn't real, it doesn't exist, that he's not God, that he isn't who he said he is, but he's still there. So what do you do with that? Let's answer the question today. Who is Jesus to you? Let me pray for us before we dive in God's word. Dear gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, your one and only son, Lord, that you allowed to come to this earth to to be born, to, to live a perfect life, Lord, because he was God. And then to lay down his life out of love for us that we could have a relationship with you restored. Lord, right now, as we dive into your word, Father, I know there's some people out here at the sound of my voice that have questions. They have questions about who you are. The enemy is trying to deceive and pull them back and cast doubt in their mind and their heart. And Lord, I pray right now against those forces of the enemy that want to deceive and blind the heart and harden the hearts of those at the sound of my voice today that haven't put in their trust and faith in you. Lord, may they hear the resounding truth of your word, the preponderance of the proof of the evidence of that you are who you say you are, that this isn't just some myth, that you aren't some some fable, some, some some Sasquatch running through the woods that somebody's trying to find, that you are more than just a ghost that that people can see and can't see, or you're more than just a, a identified, unidentified object flying through the sky, Lord, that you are God, and Lord, that you love us. And that we are your creation. That means you have the blueprint to our life, Father. You knew us in the womb before we were even born. Lord, I pray that everybody at the sound of my voice today would hear and understand that message. And Lord, that if there's anybody here that has not surrendered their heart and their life to you, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's just been playing games with you, that's just been coming to church, Lord, that just kind of believes in you, but they haven't put their trust, their faith, their life in your hands, Lord, that they would rededicate their life to you, that they would get on fire for you going into this new year. And Lord, that you would do a work that only you can do by the presentation of your word right now, Lord. We give you the glory. This is your place. This is your word. These are your people. Lord, Allow them to give you their life. And we're going to praise you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to the book of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 16. And I want to read a passage of Scripture that brings about a scenario where Jesus is with the disciples and brings about this very question that we're talking about today. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. And the word of God says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus responded, but what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, that last part's very important right there. You see, that this wasn't just some faith to be taken from the voice of man, by the understanding and wisdom of man. That this faith, that this belief, and this truth of who God is, and more importantly, who Jesus is today, is given by God. And we need to understand that. We're going to dig this out, and we're going to look at that, because we need to know what God says. And is his word true? And can we trust it? Can we trust his word today? 
You see, because the answer to the question of who is Jesus to you has to be answered, has to be. Because of the claims that this word of God and that Jesus himself made about who he was. Because when a man that's prophesied about hundreds of years before he's even born comes to earth in exactly the way that was prophesied, lives the life that he was prophesied to live, dies the way he was prophesied to die, does miracles and things on this earth that no man could comprehend, understand, or explain, and then claims to be the only way that you can find salvation and go to heaven, then you better answer the question, is he true or not? And you better know that you know. And not have a question that the enemy could slip in and bring doubt with, like he does so easily. Our young people that leave churches today, it's astronomical how the percentages that leave the church, that once they they get out of high school and they go to college, that they leave the faith. A lot of times becoming brainwashed by liberal professors and, 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 and professors who don't believe in God and, and trust only their infinite wisdom and their humanity of intelligence. And they get drifted away from the faith because they didn't have a solid anchor foundation on who Jesus is. So you need to know that today. Moms, dads, grandparents, young people, are you solid on who Jesus is? Or could you be talked out of it? by somebody who seems really smart, has a bunch of degrees, writes a bunch of papers. Could you? Here's the truth that we want to see and know today is who Jesus is. And what what we need to understand about this is it does not matter what our opinion about this is. I mean, gravity you can have an opinion about gravity. You say, man, I can't see it. I don't know. I, can, I don't think gravity exists. But you jump off the top of a building, you're going to find out really quick. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. And the same is true with God because one day a day is coming where you're going to draw your last breath. And you may have thought you did a very good job of living your life running away from him, resisting him, and making people look like fools that believed in him because of infinite wisdom of man. But then one day when you draw your last breath, you're going to be confronted with the reality that Jesus is real. And the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But then if you don't do that before you draw your last breath or before Christ returns as the Bible is unfolding before our eyes in our very nation and world today and Jesus could come back at any moment are you ready for that are you ready to meet him do you know that he's real because it's not an opinion because the the claims that Christ made are either absolute truth or it's an absolute lie There is no in-between. There is no middle ground. And we're going to look at that today. Because this is the hour of decision. Because I'm going to tell you, you're never going to be the same today after this message. Whether you receive Jesus today, whether you rededicate your life to him today and make this real, or whether you reject it, either way, you're never going to be the same. So when you're faced with the truth of who he is and all that he longs for you to be, what will you do? We're going to look at three major kind of questions, if you will, for us to look at to see biblically who God is. Who is Jesus? Is he God? And then be able to answer the question then, when we answer the question, who is Jesus? then who is he to you? The first one we want to look at is Jesus, this babe in a manger, this man that lived 33 years and then died on a cross. Is he man or is he God? Big dilemma there. Is he just a man or is he God? You see, he had all the characteristics of a man. In fact, the story And the existence of Jesus is documented not just in your Bible. Did you know that? That it's in every history book from that era. So 
Nobody can disprove or discount the fact that Jesus, the man Jesus, walked this earth. That is a fact. So the only question then becomes is, is he just a man or is he God? You see, the Bible tells us that though he had the characteristics of man, that he never sinned. He'd be like, oh, man, I don't know about that. Come on. Because the Bible says he faced every single temptation that you and I face. Every one of them. But yet, while he faced them, he never gave in. And then he stood, and this is what's so crazy. He stood before men and said words like, who among you has ever seen me commit a sin? Oh, my goodness. Man, if I stood up here and said that, there'd be hands going up all across this place. Man, my mom and dad are sitting back here. You know what I'm saying? My wife's here. My kids are here. They've seen daddy mess up, and I've had to go to them and apologize and tell them that I was in the flesh and I messed up. And moms and dads, I hope you do that when you mess up with your kids. But the, the point is, man is full of sin at the heart. So... If Jesus was just a man, that means he would have had sin. That in order to be completely free of sin, he had to be God. So there's our first claim. So how do we show it? Well, when he said, which one of you have seen me commit a sin, they couldn't say anything. Nobody could blame him or cast blame for him on anything. And in our passage, we see Jesus asked his disciples here, who do people say I am? Gave all these reasons. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But Jesus got to the point, he said, man, you know what? It really doesn't matter. I don't care what anybody else says I am. Peter, who do you say I am? So the question today from God to you and each and every one of us in our hearts is, I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what mainstream media says. I don't care what the professors in the liberal university say. I don't care what Jesus Christ superstar says. My question to you today, who do you say I am? What would you say? You see, the truth is, Jesus didn't claim to be just a man. He claimed to be God. That's why they crucified him. He went to the cross basically for three main reasons. The only things that they could find against him and accuse him of. He said he loved sinners. <laughs> he said that, you know what? He said that I'm God. He healed people on the Sabbath. That's it? You kill a man for loving sinners, healing people on the Sabbath, and claiming to be God. They couldn't find a single thing he had ever done wrong, guys. I want us to get that. Even amongst the people that hated him the most at the time, and there's a lot of people today that hate him. They hate even the mention of his name. You can mention any other religion. You can mention any other lowercase God. But you mention the name of Jesus, and the fangs come out. You mentioned this Bible and standing on the truth of this word and people call you a bigot. And people start to, to cast you out. You can hold up the Quran, you can hold up anything else and people will praise you. But you hold up this word of God and you say Jesus and you now become an outcast in this world. But will you stand anyway? We just come off that message too. You can go back and listen to that bad boy. That's good stuff. Because this is what we're talking about. Will you follow the crowd? Will you follow the wisdom of man? Or will you follow the truth of God and who he is? Because I want to tell you today, your soul and your very existence hangs in the balance. This isn't an answer to a question you can get wrong and get a do-over. Hit reset. One chance. Is it. Who will you say he is? He claimed to be the Son of God, which means that he had to be the second person of the Trinity, of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
which means that if he is God, that he must have pre-existed as God. I want you to get that concept. In other words, that his first day of existence wasn't the day of his birth. Look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 with me. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. The Word of God says this, says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word, capital W, was with God. And get this, and the Word, capital W, was God. He was God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's tried. (laughs) There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Oh, that's huge. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Get this, guys. Who is that capital W word? The word, capital W, that's the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace. Boy, there's a lot in there that is very clear on who Jesus is. That he's God. And even some religions that are out there try to refute this. If you've ever had the people come and knock on your door that are called Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe Jesus is God. Although this passage of Scripture is very clear that, in fact, he is God, that he existed in the beginning with God and is, in fact, the creator of everything. So what does the Jehovah's Witness do? They have a different translation of the Bible called the New World Translation that changes the wording of this John 1-1 because John 1-1 is very clear that the Word was with God and the Word was God and that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure that one out. But yet deception creeps in, satanic deception, and deceives the mind of people into believing that he wasn't God, even a whole denomination of a religion. They, you would see on the surface to have it all right. They claim he's the son of God. They just don't believe he was God. Let me make this very clear. That is not a parallel religion with this Bible. It's not. Because if he's just the son of God, meaning he's just a man, but he's not God, then when he died on that cross, he had sin in his heart, in my, just like you do in your heart and my heart, and that means that blood that was shed meant nothing. That means he's no different than if I died on that cross for you. He had to be God to be the perfect lamb without a blemish for the remission of sin of all mankind. But yet, the Jehovah's Witness Bible changes changes John 1, 1 into saying, and that he was a God, and the word was a God, lowercase g. That is scary stuff. That's scary stuff. And it's deception at its core. It is satanic theology to remove the deity of Jesus away from who he was. Don't fall for that deception. You see, the truth is that his incarnation, all right, that's his birth of Jesus, that it wasn't the beginning for him. That's not where he started to exist. That he was present before there was time. 
And even in the midst of all that, he knew your name. I want you to think about that for a second. The Bible says that before you were even born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. Before your mom and dad knew your name, he knew your name. You are that special to a holy God. And to restore fellowship between you and God for eternity, he came and laid down his life. That's the story of the gospel. But is it real? Can we trust it? You see, this whole Bible talks about this Jesus coming as Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel means God with us. Guys, that's huge. God with us. Every other religion, their God, their lowercase g God, is, is, is supposedly unattainable to have a relationship with. That you have to try to do things to, to please your God. You have to, to, to do things for your God in other religions. And, and the, the difference of Christianity, the difference of Christ, it's about what God has done for you. When he laid down his life for you. And that we're justified through faith and not of works. There's a big difference in that. This promise of God with us means that God came to earth and took the form of a man. He manifested himself out of love, leaving heaven's glory, coming to earth. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's huge. It's the presence of God among us in Christ Jesus. And you might say, well, man, that was 2,000 years ago. He ain't with us no more. Oh, yes, he is. Because what happened at his death, proving that he was more than a man, three days later, he rose from a grave and, re and presented himself to over 500 people. I want you to get that. 500. Proving that he is God, that he rose from the grave, showing himself as alive, resurrected. There's a big difference right there from many other religions. Because every other person of every religion, Buddha, Muhammad, they have a grave too. But there's bones in that grave. But there's a tomb in the Middle East that's empty. That you've got to give an answer for. That he was more than just a man. That he was God. The presence of of God among us was extended as Jesus left the earth and told his disciples that I must leave so that now the helper will come, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God to come and be with you and me on this earth. That's so huge, guys. That means that the presence of God is now available to walk with you through the darkest and toughest of times that God is with us. And he dwells on this earth through the lives of those that will receive him. The hard part for those that fight so hard to reject him, though, and act like he doesn't exist and that he isn't who he said he was, is still that no one can refute it. Is he man or is he God? We've seen the claim biblically that he's God. Let's keep moving forward. Number two, so is he Savior then or is he sensei? Sensei meaning teacher. Is he savior or is he sensei? You see, because a sensei, a teacher, teaches some great things. They can teach you some really good things. They can teach you discipline and, and manners and, and all kinds of great things. And Jesus was a teacher in what he did. But his claim was to more than that, that he was a savior. Because he didn't teach just of goodness he taught of godliness. And there's a step big difference. Not just to be good, but that to be godly. The morals and the ethics that he taught were different than anyone else of his age and any of the prophets. He said things like when someone strikes you on one cheek, you're to turn to them the other. When asked how many times are we to forgive our brother, he said things, you're to forgive him 70 times 7. 
count that out. And how many times when our husband or wife fails, we just write them off and look for greener pastures. When our call is to godliness to forgive, 70 times 7. He thought maybe it wasn't just the outward actions that are important. And he taught that even God knows the inward thoughts and intents of the heart. Guys, that's scary. The claims to Moses that he would know he gave him the Ten Commandments, that God gave those Ten Commandments of the law to him. But then he took them deeper. It's to say that you know that the Bible says not to commit adultery, but I say that you, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. Oh, that's more than teaching. That's moving somebody toward godliness, even in your heart, in your mind. The Ten Commandments would say, you know, it says that thou shalt not commit murder. But Jesus said, if you harbor hate in your heart without cause towards your brother, you're already guilty, or guilty of murder against him in your heart. It's the call to a higher calling. He lifted these ethics and expectations of man to the highest level, demanding that we live the kind of life that he himself lived. Be holy as I am holy, the word of God says. And that's impossible in our flesh, in our humanity, but it's only possible with the spirit of God, Emmanuel, God with us. Because he promised to put this very spirit of God that he had in your heart and in your mind so that now you and I have the power to overcome the cravings of our flesh. And apart from him, we're helpless. That's what the danger of sugar-coated preaching is, guys. It's dangerous. The sugar-coated preaching that only puts forth God as just love and just mercy and just grace and that's all true that's all of who god is but all that does is make god out to be an idol somebody here that's just here to help you here to make you feel comfortable and that's dangerous preaching allows people to somehow believe that they're okay to still live in their sin and have jesus too and that is contrary to the word of god but we preach even in, in, in evangelical messages that, that somehow God's this, this comfort that, that you need, that, that he's just only here to help you make your, make your walk through this life comfortable and pleasant. And is that true? I mean, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus said, they're going to persecute you and hate you because they hated me first. That doesn't sound very comfortable to me. But yet, people only run to the altar to seek comfort when they don't come to seek the Savior. When they fail to realize that in their humanity, that through the, because of the law that was placed in the Ten Commandments, that it shows how short they've come in meeting God's expectations. Even with what we just talked about where Jesus said it goes more than the actions, it even goes to the thoughts and intents of your heart and your mind. You see, because if you were on a plane, and I told you there was a, a parachute underneath your seat, and you need to put it on, and you'd be like, why? I thought the plane won't go down. I think it's supposed to stay in the sky. And I told you, nope, at some point it's going down. Nobody knows when. So here's your parachute. But if I told you to put this parachute on, and I didn't tell you that it was just to save your life. I told you put this parachute on because it was going to make you feel more comfortable during your flight. <laughs> and you'd be like, okay, that sounds good, like a good deal. And you put this parachute on, but maybe things didn't go so comfortable during the flight. Maybe the guy beside you stunk. <laughs> maybe the steward has come down the aisle with the hot coffee and trips and spills it all over your lap. And you've got scalded hot coffee burns all over your body. And you get entirely frustrated and you stand up and you take this parachute off and you be like, man, that's a lie. This thing didn't make my flight better at all. 
and you take it off and throw it down because you were told a lie about what the parachute was really for. The parachute wasn't to make your flight comfortable. The parachute is to save your life. But because you took it off, because you got frustrated when the flight wasn't comfortable and the plane goes down, now you die. Change that to the, to the real truth of the gospel. I want you to put this parachute on because at any moment this plane could go down and you're going to need it to jump off this plane and save your life. It's the only way you're going to survive. So now you're sitting there with anticipation, knowing that you're safe, that at any moment when the plane goes down, that you're alive. It doesn't matter that the dude beside you stinks. It doesn't matter that the steward has spilled coffee all over you. It doesn't matter that everybody is taking up the bathroom and you can't get to the bathroom and you're sitting there really uncomfortable. None of that matters anymore because you know you have it. And then when the engines shut off, you know you have life. You see, because in the midst of the flight not being comfortable, you didn't take your parachute off because you knew that's what, what it was for, baby. Anybody getting a message today from the Lord? Jesus, Savior, not just for your comfort in this life. It's to save you from the depravity of your heart that separates you from a holy God for eternity. Have you ever broke the Ten Commandments? You ever lied? Not a person here could say they ever haven't. Even if it's when you were young, you've lied before. You ever stolen? Yeah, guarantee you, everybody here has stolen something. Even small, pen, pencil, piece of gum when you're a kid. So what does that make you? You're already a liar and a thief in God's eyes. You ever committed adultery? Be like, whoa, nope. Jesus said, you ever done it with your eyes and your mind and your heart? And a lot of men here would say, oh, even women. You ever committed murder? Nah, man, never done that. That makes me better than a lot of people. Oh, Jesus said, if you've ever harbored hate in your heart against somebody, you've already murdered them in your heart. Oh. You see what I'm going? You need the parachute. Because we've all fallen short of God's glory. And the parachute isn't just to give you happiness. It's to give you holiness in the eyes of God. And there's a big difference in that message. So when you take this parachute today, when you receive Jesus today, when you rededicate your life to him today, you're receiving salvation. You're receiving a savior who is Christ the Lord, not some genie in a bottle that's here for you to rub when things get tough and just to help you out through life. That's great. Don't get me wrong. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from God. Yes, he chooses to bless. And then he also is sometimes allows trials and tribulations like he did in the life of Job like he did in the life of Joseph, like he did in the life of Peter, like he did in the life of Paul. You see where we're going? That's the danger of the prosperity gospel that says God wants to make you healthy, wealthy, and, and, and just make you feel great. That's not in here. What is in here? It's for you to stand strong, for you to persevere, for you to put your heart and trust and faith in the one who has come as Savior. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. That means today that you have a God that you can call daddy. It doesn't get any warmer than that. He's not a cosmic cop waiting to zap you and beat you down. He's waiting to meet you where you're at and to wrap his arms of love around you and to provide you the parachute that you need to escape eternity from a place called hell. That's why he came to this earth and he's God in the flesh and he's asking for you to ask the very real question in your heart, who is he? And to make a decision that he is Lord of your life. Have you done that today or have you just been playing games and coming to church? 
Or have you just been carrying a Bible in your heart that never, that never changes your heart? It never changes how you speak with or treat your spouse. It never affects how you raise your kids. It never affects what you do on weekends. It never affects what you listen to or what you watch or what you say. Are you playing games with God or do you have it? It's time this Christmas to get right about who he is. Third point, last point in closing, which brings us to the very real question. Is he Lord or is he a liar? Because he's one or the other. He's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Which is he? Because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the savior of the world. He made claims in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oprah in 2008 said that there's many ways to heaven. Is that true? Not according to God's word, not according to Jesus himself. So that makes him exclusive. Lord of all or not Lord at all. Lord or liar, how do we know? How do we know? We know that he's all-powerful, that, that he had authority over even the elements of nature. We see biblical accounts of that, the people that, that put to pen these things, that documented these accounts of, of what he had done. And so many people get tripped up, and, and, and I even used to years and years ago, and I stopped doing it. But you, know, you get the, the innocent saying of, of talking about the elements, and whether you say Mother Nature or Mother Earth. You ever done that before? Man, I did years ago, but I stopped that mess. Man, because it seems so innocent and joking. But there is no Mother Nature and Mother Earth. Do you know that? I mean, so many people sit down in their pretzel-like positions and their crisscross applesauce with their little fingers closed and they're like, mm, and they're waiting on like some kind of zap of energy from the universe. Hey, man, you need something that really happened in your life. You need a, a, a movement, a supernatural movement in your life. You're going to sit there till you get arthritis. Ain't nothing going to happen because there is no Mother Earth. There is no Mother Nature. You get sick. You need a. You need healing. You get to the point and your finances and in your heart where things are going astray and you need a supernatural divine hand in your kid's life or in your marriage or in your home, go hug a ponderosa pine. Let me know where you get the next day. Because the truth is there is no mother nature, mother earth. There's only God the Father. It's time we stop playing games. So is the Bible true? Can we trust God's word? Here's where it gets really good. I know we're going long, but that's all right. Y'all don't want to go home anyway, do you? Hey, did you know that there's something called the Human Genome Project? Scientific. This ain't out of the 700 Club or Focus on the Family, y'all. This is secular research that somehow proves through the human genome and looking at people's DNA, they've traced it back to now say, hey, guess what? All of the DNA of the six, seven billion people in the world can be traced back to two people. Secular research. And the Bible talks about God's creation, Adam and Eve, that two people, the whole world started from a man and a woman. Is that not enough for you? Maybe we should go a little deeper then. Because many in our world, maybe even some by the sound of my voice, don't believe God's word is true. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe he's the only way to heaven. They don't believe that this is the total authority on life and on morality. And since your soul's hanging in the balance of your infinite wisdom, let me give you the totality of the evidence in Scripture that you will not be able to horribly mistake or overcome. You see, hundreds of years before Christ was born, men made record in the prophecies of the Old Testament, detailed predictions, if you will, of the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Over 300 prophecies in this book made by human beings written hundreds of years before the man Jesus even walked the earth. Okay, so, what does that mean? Well, let's look at that. 
because this is huge because there's been atheistic mathematicians and scientists that have set out to disprove the Bible. Did you know that? Many of which, in their quest, their lifelong quest to disprove something that they don't even think exists, come to see that this is truth. One world-class mathematician looked at the prophecies, all of these, and found that there was only one chance in 87 followed by 93 zeros that those kind of predictions could be fulfilled by one man who was written about hundreds of years before he was born. What are some of those? What are some of these prophecies? The exact time of his birth was given in Daniel 9. The fact that he would be born of a virgin was given in Isaiah 7, 14. That he would be born in Bethlehem was given in Micah 5, 4. That he would be born into the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10. That his ministry would begin in Galilee, Isaiah 9, 1. That he would work miracles, Isaiah 61, 1. That he would teach in parables, Psalm 78, 2. That he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 9, 9. That he would be betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41, 9. That he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Over, Zechariah 11:12 12, that he would be accused by false witnesses Psalm 35 11, that he would be wounded and bruised Isaiah 53 5 that his hands and feet would be pierced Psalm 22 16 that he would be crucified with thieves Isaiah 53 12 that his garments would be torn apart and lots cast for them Psalm 22 18 that his bones would not be broken Psalm 34 20 that his side would be pierced Zechariah 12 10 that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9, that he would raise from the dead, Psalm 16, 10. Are you kidding me? The chances for you to win the lottery are one in 175 million. Would you bet your life on one ticket? Would you? If I said, I'll, I'll pay you ticket. Just give me your life. One chance. One in seven. One in 175 million. Give me your wife, your kids, everything you own, everything. I want everything, even your life. Would you take the chance for one in 175 million? Not a single person in this place or on this earth would take that odd. The chance of being struck by lightning, one in 960,000. Would you take that chance? Stand out in the middle of this field out here, holding a 10-foot metal pole in the middle of a lightning storm? Would you? People still don't take that chance. One in, in 960,000, that's a pretty good odds. What do you mean you're not going to take that? Chances of you getting killed and eaten by a shark at the beach this summer. One in 3,750,000. People take that chance all the time. Don't think anything of it. But a guy named Peter Stoner, world-class mathematician, has come and done the math for you. What are the chances that a man could come to earth and fulfill just 16 of those 300 prophecies? that were written about him hundreds of years before he was born. What are the chances? You want to know what that chance is? The number 1 in 10 followed by 45 zeros. That's a whole lot worse chance than the lottery, y'all. But you wouldn't gamble your life on a ticket? But you'll gamble your life on those odds? Oh, it gets gets different because see Jesus fulfilled all 300 of the prophecies not just 16 so he upped it he said what are the chances that this one man could fulfill just 48 of these 300 prophecies it's the number 1 in 10 followed by 150 to the 157th power that's 157 zeros that's not even a number we won't gamble our odds on the simple lottery ticket. We won't gamble our life on that, but you will gamble your life and the soul of your very existence on a number of 10 to the 157th power. I want you to think about that real hard right now. Jesus is who he said he is. 
Peter Stoner concluded and wrote this. He says, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. So what do you do with that? Basically what it's saying, it, it disproves the null hypothesis. In other words, it's not a guess. It wasn't an accident that he is who he said he is, that he is God. And then the Bible says, you can receive him or reject him today. But make no mistake, at one point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So why don't you do it now before it's too late? Why don't you put your trust and faith in God? I'm going to tell you, we have faith in everything we do in this life. You have faith coming in today when you sat in that chair. Have you ever sat in that chair before? How'd you know it's going to hold you up then? Just trust that the boneheads that made it, made it good enough to hold me. I don't know. You have faith every time you get in your car and drive that the people who worked on that vehicle and made it didn't mess things up so that the wheel falls off when you're going 70 mile an hour down the highway and throws you into a tree and kills you. You have faith and trust. You have faith every time that you get on a plane that the pilot's been trained and he knows and is competent on how to fly the airplane. Did you ever go check his credentials before you got in the seat? And did you ever go look for his diploma and his certificate? You have faith when you sit down, don't you? You have faith every time you go to the doctor and get a surgery, that he knows the difference between a tonsillectomy and a hysterectomy, because there's a big difference. And you have faith and trust that he's competent and knows as he cuts open your body and examines and pulls out things and fixes things and sews you back up. You have faith every time you go to the pharmacist to fill a prescription that a doctor has written some squiggly lines on that look like a chicken has scratched all over it, and you put that in front of a man's face, and he goes back and mixes chemicals and gives you pills to go home and says, take this twice a day. That's faith. Now take that same faith and put that faith and trust in Jesus today. Give him your heart and give him your life because he is who he said he is. And there's no escaping and no running away from it. That he is God. And he loves you. And he's come to give you life. Because he was more than just a man. He is God. Like a man, yes, he was born in a manger. And his mother had to wrap him in swaddling clothes to keep him warm. But like God, prophets told of his birth hundreds of years before he was even born. Like a man, he worked by the sweat of his brow as a carpenter, and, and he felt pain, and, and he sweat, and he hungered, and he thirsted. But like God, and only like God, he healed the sick, he made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and he called the dead man out of his grave when he said, Lazarus, come forth. Like a man, they put the crown of thorns on his head, they put the nails in his hands and his feet, and they pierced his side, and he cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? But like God, and only like God could do, he chose to stay there on that cross, knowing that at any whisper, at any snap of his finger, he could call thousands of angels with swords drawn to slay every man and person right there and to free himself on the cross. But he chose to hang there because he loved you so much, because he is God. Like a man, after he was crucified, they took his cold dead body and they placed it in a tomb and they sealed it with a stone saying we're not going to have to hear from this man anymore but like God and only like God can do like prophet said he was going to do hundreds of years before he was even born on the third day he rose from that grave why because he's God and in that victory over hell death in the grave he is now offering you the same hope that same Victory, if you will receive him. He said to all who will receive him, he gave the right to become a child of God. You can call him daddy today. You can enter the family and the, and the fellowship of God Almighty, the creator of all heaven and earth, because of his son Jesus, who came in a manger and was born to die. Will you put your trust and your faith in him right now and not trust the wisdom of man who tries to say he is not who he said he is? Let's bow our head and close our eyes right now. 
You change when you confront Christ. You change when you confront Christ. You do. When you confront this message, whether you receive him or reject him, you're going to change today. The rich young ruler who confronted Jesus, and Jesus gave him the truth of how to be saved. And he said, give all your possessions to the poor, take up and come follow me. And the Bible says he went away dejected, depressed. He changed because he couldn't give his heart to Jesus. Think of Judas, who couldn't change, even though he was called out that one of you is going to betray me tonight. Almost an opportunity for Judas, for Judas to change, but he rejected that truth, and he turned away. And he had to kill himself because he was so depressed. He rejected the Savior, and it cost him his joy. It cost him his life. But yet you look at the people who were confronted like Paul on the road to Damascus, and he was struck and down, and, and Paul yelled out, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, who have you been persecuting? And at that, po at that moment, when Paul was confronted with the very God of the universe, he obeyed, and he went and had the scales removed from his eyes that had been placed on him, and he could see, and he gave his life to the gospel. Think of Peter, who was confronted with the resurrected Messiah. He had just denied Jesus in the face of men before the crucifixion, and now the resurrected Jesus comes to him and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And when that happened, the man that had somehow denied him before men now gave his life for him, even being crucified upside down. I want you to think about that. You don't do that for a lie. These men had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. You're having that same encounter today. Will you receive him or reject him? No more games to be played. Give your life fully and completely to Jesus and surrender your heart to him. If you've never done that today, I'm going to lead you through a prayer, and I want you to pray from your heart to God's heart and mean business with him and get it right this holiday season before it's too late. Put your faith and trust in him. You have faith in everything else. Put your faith in Jesus, who is God and loves you. You're here today, you say, Brad, man, I've walked in out of church doors. I've heard this message before. I even had an emotional experience at the altar one day, but I've never experienced a life change, a heart change. I've never experienced that, and today I want to get it right. Or maybe you say, I've drifted away, man, life's been hard, and I I've run the things and, and tried to, to, to put th things and idols in my life or, or turn the things for happiness that I shouldn't have, and today I want to come back to the cross and get it right today. I want you to pray that same prayer from your heart to God's heart right now. To receive it for the first time or rededicate your life to him to say dear god i'm coming to you right now running to the cross i'm admitting to you that i'm a sinner that i've fallen short of your glory that i've messed up and that as such i'm in need of you as a savior lord thank you for sending jesus to die on the cross god in the flesh that I could have forgiveness of my sin. And then proven that he was God, raised him from the dead three days later. Lord, I want that same victory, that same hope in my life right now. And Lord, my commitment to you right now is to make you Lord of my life. As I answer the question of who is Jesus to me, you're my everything. <laughs> you're not just my co-pilot. You're my pilot. I'm getting in the other seat now. And I'm letting you direct my heart and my life. I'm putting my faith and my trust and my hope in you. And from this day forward, my commitment is to live my life for you. If you prayed that prayer right now and you meant business with God and you received him for the first time, I want you to forget totally the person around you, behind you, beside you for a moment. This is the decision between you and God. Don't let the enemy hold you down anymore. If you prayed that prayer, you meant business with God today, receiving him for the first time or, re, or, re, or rededicating your life to him boldly right now, unashamed. Raise your hand, say, Brad, I prayed that prayer. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of God. I am answering the question right now of who Jesus is to me, hands are up all across this place. If I don't see you, God does. Right now we're going to close our service like we do every week here at Impact, and I know we're over. I, ain't, I know we're over. But I want to offer you an opportunity right now.
to put action with your feet to what God's done in your heart. Maybe you received him for the first time today. Maybe you rededicated your life to him. There's going to be pastors up here. I want you to come let them know what God's placed on your heart today. Make a commitment that you're getting your life right with God today. and You're not ashamed, and Jesus is everything to you. And you need somebody to pray with you. Maybe you still have questions about this message, about who Jesus is, about who God is, about is the Bible true. Please come and ask. We want to sit down with you. We want to have coffee with you. We want to have lunch with you. We want to answer those questions because eternity weighs in the balance. Maybe you're here today and you said, Brad, I've been looking for a church home that preaches the Bible like this, and I've I got to be here right now. I want my kids under this ministry. I want my wife, my husband under this ministry, and I want to join this church. Would you come forward as well? Maybe you've been coming here and you say, I need to get plugged in. I need to get served, and I want to take part in all these things you do for the community and for reaching people. We want you to come forward. Whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart, put action to it with your feet right now. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing with all our heart. Let's sing with all our voice. Let's praise the Savior today. But ultimately, let's move on what God's putting on our heart. Will you move today? Will you answer the call? Come as they play. God I serve knows only how to try My God will never fail. My God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Yeah, for the battle. forward whatever the Lord's laid upon your heart whatever it is just move just move don't let the enemy hold you in your seat anymore tell somebody this is who Jesus is to me is he Lord of your life the Bible tells us that he is our strong tower that he is our refuge in time of trouble Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Is he your king? Is he your Lord of your life? Who is he today? He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the bright morning star. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. Who is he to you? Have you put your faith and your trust in him? Are you surrendered completely to him, Christian? Are you? Is your faith real where it's changed your life, your heart, your everything? Are you moving in the direction of holiness, holiness that only is present with the Spirit of God in your life?
is Jesus to you, I hope you know today, and I hope you've made the commitment that he's everything, that he's king of kings, he's Lord of lords, that he is the perfect lamb of God, the lamb that was led to the slaughter to be slain, but he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back with eyes of fire and a tongue like a sword, and there will be a place no more of evil, no more sorrow, that there'll be a new heaven, a new earth. Will you be in that place with him? Will you? Because it's real and it's coming. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Let yours do it now while you have the chance. I trust that you've done that today. Maybe you didn't come forward. We're going to be up here for a while. Will you come let somebody know before you walk out this place? We want to meet you and pray with you. We want you to know that you know that Jesus is Lord today of your life. It means everything because he's coming to make all things new and he'll make all things new in your life. Let's take this message to heart. Let's go this week. Let's surrender our hearts, our lives to him and let's make an impact for Jesus and we're going to see you next Sunday. Lord bless you guys.